I'm hoping to cover a number of subjects at this camp meeting. I believe I have six presentations and two question and answer sessions. The question and answer sessions will be after class number four and after class number six. I'm only going to be taking written questions that have be already been submitted to me. I'm not sure who's collating that information, but if you do have questions, um, then please um, pass them on to whoever's responsible for that, and I don't know who that person is. Um, I'll try to tilt as wide a range of questions as possible, so it doesn't specifically have to be connected to what I'm teaching, but I hope um, that it is. Um, I think people will find that more useful. This introductory um, presentation is a follow-on or perhaps even a summary of a presentation that I did last week. And it deals with how we read inspiration. How do we approach both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? Now, as a movement, I think it's fair to say that we have done a fairly reasonable job at decoding and interpreting scripture. We have made mistakes in the past, but I think by and large, many of those um, mistakes that we made or perturbations have really been straightened out and corrected. Our biggest problem when we approach inspiration, at least from my perspective, is not our reading of the Bible. In fact, if we just had the Bible and nothing else, we would have been benefited, but we also would have had a great loss. We would have been benefited by being much more diligent and careful in how we read. Unfortunately, what we would have lost out on is the rich information that we find in the spirit of prophecy. When it particularly comes to three issues, health reform, the nature of man, and of course prophecy. The problem that we have experienced in this movement, and not only us, but large swathes of Adventists, in fact, I, th I would venture to say most Adventists, is how we approach the spirit of prophecy, not how we approach the Bible. And to express it in a very simple way, and the problem with expressing things simply is that it's quite um, a black and white affair. It's like a bludgeon. It's either on the left or on the right. There's no subtlety, there's no nuance. And I know in any subject, the nuance is very important. But a simplistic perspective, overview, at least from my thinking, is that most people, most Adventists, whatever ilk you are of, people will call them... Um, Pharisees and Sadducees, liberals, conservatives, whatever camp you might either be labelled in or feel that you're part of, I think most of us are firm in our acceptance and belief in Holy Writ, in the Bible. We don't have a problem accepting a thus saith the Lord. What our problem is, 
and it's a problem that is widespread throughout Adventism, no matter what your theological leaning is, is that it's hard to understand large portions of scripture. Much of it is locked away and it's taken God's people many years to try to unlock some of that information, some of that truth. And of course, what needs to be provided for a people um, to be able to unlock inspiration is a prophet. Now we might call, we might use the word prophet, or we might use the word messenger of the Lord, or we might use the phrase first, second or third angel's messenger. Whatever phrase you use, I think at least from this study, from the perspective that I want us to see, these should be considered as synonymous terms. Whichever one of those three angels of Revelation 14 you might think of, and that would be dispensationally dependent, or a messenger of the Lord, or a prophet, or as Ella White might say in the Great Controversy, God's chosen servant. Without such a person, sometimes a group of people, inspiration remains pretty much um, locked, especially the pertinent pieces of information that God's people need in any particular dispensation. Whether it's a dispensation of scattering or a dispensation of gathering. Either one, in order to understand how to behave appropriately in that dispensation, in that time period in which you find yourself, you need a messenger sent by God to be able to direct and guide. It's not my purpose to speak about degrees of inspiration. Alan White does speak to this matter and I, and I'm assuming the rest of you, recognise that there is uh, such a thing as degrees of inspiration. But I'm not trying to um, compartmentalise these messengers into any one particular box. I just want to use these terms um, in a loose and generic fashion when I say prophet, uh, messenger or angel. So the problem that we find ourselves in, we as Adventists, and I'll say for much of our existence as priests in this movement, the dilemma that we have found ourselves in is that when we approach the spirit of prophecy, we have considered Alan White's writings in the wrong light, in the wrong fashion. We have considered her body of work to be present truth. And what I mean by that is that we consider her to be a present day prophet, a prophet for the dispensation in which we live. And the reason we do that is because of the style of Alan White's words. The way she writes to us, God's people, she gives this emphasis or this perspective that has led Adventism to believe that we should read her books as present day information. In essence, we have turned a 19th century prophet into a 21st century prophet. And 
thinking people in Adventism as they have seen this done by many people they have basically gone down two routes one route is basically a complete disregard or rejection of the spirit of prophecy and without discussing the issue that or the perspective that people will reject Ellen White because she touches their lives personally and what I mean by that is if you want to practice a particular vice she will tell you that you're not allowed to and like many of your forefathers you may be inclined to reject her I'm not speaking to that type of rejection I'm speaking to the rejection of careful and well laid thoughts and ideas what I mean by that is that many thinking Adventists as they read Alan White's writings recognize a phenomena one that it's quite plain for them to see and it's this that Ellen White's writings are not fit for purpose they see far too many problems idiosyncrasies in her works and they come to a place where they wholeheartedly reject her writings I'm sure many of us have heard stories or tales sometimes it's it is um, folk tales which have turned into folklore where people have heard stories that liberal Adventist pastors have um, as the phrase goes burnt those little red books the reason that they used to use that term little red books is because most of um, Spirit of Prophecy the, the, the books themselves used to be of a high quality um, hardback version which were finished off in a really nice um, burgundy or red binding and they used to call them these little red books and liberal elements in the church got to the place where they would have book burning sessions I have never seen any pictures of this I've never experienced it but I've heard it um, numerous times so I guess there is some validity in that whether or not people literally burnt the books the effect was the same it's a rejection of inspiration of the spirit prophecy so that's one group that have been challenged with inspiration with the spirit prophecy and that's the road or the path that they have taken and the reason why I want to suggest that they have taken that path is not because Ellen White restricts their personal freedom when she says you cannot do this or you cannot live in a particular style or a particular way I know there are people who have rejected her for those reasons I'm not referring to those types of people and then you get the other group of people they see the problems but what they do is bury their heads in the sand and they ignore disregard all the little problems that they read about in inspiration and what I want to suggest is that like David's band of men this movement has been like a magnet to attract that class of people so what they have what this movement has done is attracted a group of people who think about what they read and they do see problems but what they do is they just ignore those problems they basically whitewash over them and there are different answers that, that they will give different excuses if I can say of why they will do that so I'm not here to um, discuss those excuses or the reasons or to discuss if they're valid or not but what I do want to say is 
that when they read, they see discrepancies and they basically ignore them. They're the two groups that Adventism has been divided into. And I would venture to say that the vast majority, I mean like in the 90s, the people who have joined this movement, we call them priests, have been of the second class. Those people who read inspiration and they accept inspiration, they believe in Ellen White's writings, but they see problems and when they see those problems, instead of confronting them and dealing with them, they ignore them. If they were to genuinely deal with those issues, those idiosyncrasies, those problems, I think many of them would end up being in the camp of the group of people who openly reject the spirit of prophecy. Because I think intellectually there has not been much choice between these two responses. You either ignore what you read or you take it at face value and you're forced to essentially reject Ellen White's writings. Now the vast majority of Adventists do this in such a subtle way that they don't actually have um, cognitive recognition that they're actually rejecting the spirit of prophecy. They don't have an awareness that they're doing that. There's a phrase that's used in psychology, it's called cognitive dissidence. Cognitive meaning brain function, dissident meaning um, a denial or a rejection or an unbelief. So cognitive dissidence is basically a denial of what your brain is actually really telling you and you persuade yourself cognitively that the thing that is untrue actually becomes true. Now this group of people that became priests they were keen um, readers of inspiration they approach Alan White's writings and the things that they don't understand they basically ignore. And then God changes dispensations from a scattering to a gathering. And this gathering period, the time period in which we live, is the period when these priests have been gathered. And in order for these priests to be gathered, a prophet or a messenger has to be raised up. We tend to call that a messenger the first angel's message or the first angel or the first angel's messenger. Most of us would be comfortable in acknowledging that that was Elder Jeff Pippinger. So my point in bringing that subject up is not to address anything specific to him as a person or in his ministry per se but just to recognize in order for a gathering to occur God has to raise up a messenger the first angel's messenger the first angel that person has to be raised up in order to direct people to understand inspiration, I'm going to say correctly. So what this messenger will do is the messenger will go into inspiration and instruct you how you are supposed to read things that everyone else is reading as well but they read differently. Whether you consider Revelation 14, Revelation 18, and Ellen White's perspective of those angels and their ministry, what this messenger will instruct you in is the art of 
reading inspiration properly for this dispensation. So this messenger will teach you how to consider the latter rain, how to consider the sealing of God's people who comprises the 144,000. Basically end time prophetic issues are going to be discussed by this messenger as this person begins to instruct you on how to read inspiration. And the problem that we will find in this movement with, as we do this is that onlookers, our Adventist brethren who look at what we are doing and what is being taught will look in horror and dismay at how we basically treat inspiration. For those of who, are, who have already rejected inspiration, um, what we do in this movement is just basically um, of none effect for them. It's a waste of time because all of our prophetic end time message is all built upon the spirit of prophecy. It's really not built upon the Bible. There's just not enough information given in the Bible um, for us to have a full understanding of how end time prophecy works. The symbology is too vague, it needs to be explained and the gaps, the, the spaces in between the way marks need to be linked together and that is the work of a present day prophet. So these people who have rejected Alan White's writings will not turn to us because what they recognise is that our message is built purely and solely upon her writings and having rejected her they're forced intellectually to reject us. The other group of Adventists who have accepted Ellen White, who have been plagued with the idiosyncrasies that they see in her writings, they too have to reject our message because they can clearly see that when we speak about end time prophecy and we quote Ellen White's writings, we then begin to twist and manipulate her writings in a way that they recognise to be actually incorrect and if I can say it plainly wrong and what we have done with that group of people because we've largely ignored um, if we call them the Sadducees or the liberal class in our church we've largely ignored them because we have not seen that they are fit to um, even converse with in fact there's very little to converse with them because there's no um, connection with them. There's no point that we can meet mind with mind. But we do have a hope with this other group. And the problem with them is that they reject us because they recognise that when we read an inspired statement, that what we do is we change the meaning of what is actually written. We change the dynamic, we change the context. And it's these subtle changes that they can recognise even if they cannot um, verbalise. Even if they cannot put their finger to what the problem is, they realise that there are problems. I want to give a very simple example. So without naming any names and this is probably so far in the distant the distance um, in the far distant past that only a few of us a few of you here if you would would recognize or know who the pers person stroke people are um, because most of us in this movement here are, are new now so 
many years ago, there was obviously a great revival occurring in God's church through the work of this movement. And as has always been the case, we have attracted many people, often in the hundreds. People come, they stay, and they go. It's just a phenomena that um, has happened repeatedly that I guess we just have to accept. So there was a member in this movement who had accepted everything. If I can say it this way, hook, line and sinker, they had believed the message and the particular doctrinal issue that I'm referring to um, that's going to give us this example is the subject of the latter rain. They had accepted our understanding, our perspective of the latter rain. But what began to happen, as often happens with people who join this movement, because they are affiliated with, I'll call them conservative Adventists, those Adventists who believe and uh, practice what's written in the Spirit of Prophecy and they believe it to such a degree that they just take everything at face value even things that don't make sense. So this member in the movement like most of us um, came from that class, that group and still obviously had friends, associates perhaps even family, who were still there and the member had left, having joined this movement. And as is often the case, people want to talk. We want to try to win these people and in order to win them, we have to persuade them. In order to persuade them, we have to speak with them. In order to speak with them, we have to have a dialogue. And a dialogue by definition means that they have opportunity to speak to us and challenge us to try to understand what it is that we believe, what it is that we understand. Unfortunately, for many of us, when we were challenged what tended to happen was that we would not be willing to dialogue with people. And what tended to happen is that we would cast these people in a certain light. Now, I'm not here going to speak to the fact that we were perhaps rude, belligerent, uh, badly behaved. So I'm not speaking to that issue. What I am speaking, um, the issue that I am speaking to, is our unwillingness to listen to other people's perspectives. Particularly those, as I said, whom we wanted to try to win and not listening to them caused us problems. We had real difficulty in trying to attract people into the movement. We did, it, we did attract a number of people who, as I say, joined our movement. And I want to say it this way, many of those people, if I can say many of us, we were, it, this might be um, a problematic way to say this, but we were duped into uh, joining this movement we were persuaded to accept things at face value. And 
think many of us did that without fully understanding what we were getting into. So this subject, this story, is a, the story of the latter rain, as I've already said. This member has obviously joined the movement and they then begin to speak with people that they've left and they begin to be challenged by what they hear as they try to persuade their friends, their brethren, their sisters to join this movement. And what they're confronted with is the following the following problem. Alan White teaches very clearly that the latter rain is poured out after the National Sunday Law. For us in the movement, this is the Sunday Law of verse 41. This is the Sunday Law that Alan White speaks about um, hundreds of times in her writings. When she refers to the latter rain, she's very explicit and clear that what she's referring to is the experience of, if I use it, if I use this term, God's people, in the time period of the National Sunday Law. And the problem that this member was facing is that this movement, the messenger of this movement, was clearly teaching for a very long time, which this member had initially accepted, that the latter rain was already being poured out upon God's people before the Sunday law. They had accepted that based upon, I'm just going to use the term cult of personality, but I want to add to that also Alan White quotes, Alan White uh, passages that seem to infer that the latter rain was already being poured out upon God's people in the time frame that was obviously before the Sunday Law. So we use the logic to persuade people of this reality, of this fact, as we would see it, as Elder Jeff Pippinger would see it, that the latter rain had already begun to be poured out before the Sunday Law. And this stood in direct contradiction to the majority of Alan White's writings. And what happened to this member is that they were forced to leave. Now we could argue that, and we often do, that they left for other reasons. And we tend to do that, like most organisations, to make ourselves feel better, to justify their leaving and our remaining. Now, that example has been repeated hundreds of times, literally, and may venture, may be approaching um, over a thousand times where people have been confronted with this movement's understanding of theological matters that have stood in contradiction to inspiration and people have been challenged to know what to do. The vast majority of people who remained in this movement, I want to say, if I can say it this way, to their shame, remained in the movement despite the fact that they could see validity in the arguments that were being presented by those people who were going to lead the movement because they recognised that there were problems in our message. Many people were ignorant to these problems. They didn't, um, they, they weren't able to see what was going on. They were just, if I can call them rank and file members. 
and they ignorantly uh, remained in the movement thinking everything was okay. But this has been a recurring problem in our movement for a long time that those people who have been willing to try to deal with problems that this movement teaches that stands in contradiction to inspired statements from Alan White have been faced with a problem. Either they just accept the word of the messenger without understanding what they mean, why they come to these conclusions, or they walk away. And I want to suggest the brave ones are the ones that walk. The ones that are not willing to be intellectually honest with themselves have remained in the movement. This has been a problem that has been with us for a very long time. Things began to change a number of years ago. I came across a really nice statement and I'm going to read it to you. I'm not going to give you the author's name because it's irrelevant. But I really think this is true. And what's so sad about this statement is that this keynote thought is something that we have professed, we have claimed that we have practiced in this movement for decades. And I want to suggest that that is actually not the case. This is the statement. Quote, Superficiality is the bane of scholarship. Truth has nothing to fear from thorough investigation. It thrives on scrutiny. Its very nature courts the light. I'll read it again. Superficiality is the bane of scholarship. Truth has nothing to fear from thorough investigation. It thrives on scrutiny. Its very nature courts the light. Now, I don't want to cast this movement or individuals in this movement, particularly Elder Jeff, in any bad light. That's not the point I want to discuss. That's not the point I'm trying to make in this, in these introductory thoughts that we're having now. But what I do want to say is that as this movement began to take seriously the mantra or the the call or the cry that we used to have that methodology or line upon line is what this movement was built upon, was created upon. As we tried to transition into that phase, it caused shaking after shaking in this movement and the reason why there was a shaking is because people were confronted with two things either this new view this new approach or the cult of personality and the cult of personality has not just been confined to Elder Jeff Pippinger. There have been other people, other teachers, other leaders who have been raised up, who have shared in that same guilt, that same space, where they have used the force of their personality to control and direct people. And despite that, God has managed to circumvent much of those 
problems, much of the damage that had been done through that methodology and has managed to bring this movement into a place that is as different as light or day is from night as light is from darkness compared to where we were before. Now, as I say, I don't want to I don't want people to understand what I've said is that Elder Jeff destroyed or wrecked this movement. He and the leaders that were raised up, I think they were raised up through God's providence, through the direction and ministry of angels. And I don't want, this is not an exercise in disparaging individuals. If it wasn't for Elder Jeff, I know I could say this for all of us, none of us would be here of course, but on a personal level I really would not be here. I would not be the person that I am. I would not, um, and I mean this in a positive sense, um, I would have not become the person that I am without his help and his assistance. Um, and I know our opponents would um, jump upon those words and, you know, obviously manipulate them. I'm hoping you all understand the point that I'm trying to make. And I think each of us, in, in our own personal way, could attest to that. So, what I want to say to us, the point that I want to make, is the following. I don't want to put a date on it per se, but if we were to go back to around 2007, I would suggest around 2007, this movement is going to be confronted in a way that it had never been confronted before with the subject of methodology. God begins to raise up people in this movement who, who are willing, and not only willing, who are able, who have the fortitude, who have the acumen, the ability to interrogate inspiration, to use um, available tools to analyse what this movement is teaching to begin to redirect, begin to change the direction in which this movement had been headed, which was a movement that was largely based upon, as I say, a cult of personality. And what I want us to understand is that when God does that, when he raises people up, he doesn't just raise them in obscurity. Through providence, he allows his goodwill to take its effect and allows those people to be put into places of influence whereby whatever light they have to share is able to be transmitted in a meaningful way into this movement. And I want to suggest that, that this work began to occur in earnest around 2007. So it's been here for about 13 years. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that methodology was never used before. Of course it was. I, along with all of the rest of you, understand that methodology, which we call line upon line, Isaiah 28, verse 10, 
and 13 was light and truth that was given to Elder Jeff Pippinger. I want to just use that statement just to segue into a small um, side thought and then come back to um, our discussion. Often in our movement today we speak about new light and I came across a, um, a dialogue between two members in this movement that spoke about new light and the discussion was um, with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to deal with that subject in either a later presentation or in a later camp meeting because for, for those of us who are aware I'm going to be doing camp meetings for the next three weekends and it will probably be it will probably turn out that they will be continuous thoughts um, depending on how far we get in our studies this week this weekend so without going into the subject matter itself one person was saying what he's being taught is present truth new light and what this other person was saying was that what they were discussing was was not new light it was old light and there's always been this dilemma between new light and old light new truth present truth old truth um, good truth however we want to phrase it we've always tended to put subject into these two boxes so when I say that Elder Jeff was given new light and the reason I use the term new light is from the phrase that we all use which is an increase of knowledge and it's this increase of knowledge has a reference point we call it the time of the end so the time of the end new light comes and the reason we know it's new light is because a new angel arrives with a new message from God in Ellen White's framework if you were to go to early writings she portrays this as an angel flying from heaven having received from Jesus a scroll and this angel flies to earth and reads this scroll out to the inhabitants of the earth she gives it in this graphic literal um, language so I'm going to call this new light it's a new message begins at the time of the end and then this message begins to swell or increase we call it an increase of knowledge and I'm saying that is um, how we normally portray new light but what I want to remind us is that this new light is not new light at all it's just an old message that has been repackaged rebranded so I want to caution those of us who are listening to these presentations and I'm hoping that those members who are having that dialogue are actually either not list if they're not listening live will listen to this presentation when when it gets uploaded onto um, the internet that they will recognize that the argument about new light and old light is a fallacious erroneous argument this is not an argument that is actually valid when this movement say, speaks of new light it speaks about it in the context of a reform line or the time of the end when a new message comes and you have an increase of knowledge that's the new light that people refer to but this new light is not new it's just the repackaging or a rebranding of an existing message that had done its work 
in the previous generation. Depending on who a person is, how cognizant they are of what they are doing, some people are very aware of what they're doing and others are confused and duped into following a path without categorizing where people are, whether they do things maliciously or ignorantly, I want us to recognize that when someone says or someone begins to argue that what we're teaching or what we should be teaching or anything that we say should only be new light and someone says no, there is old light to be gleaned that the perspective that they have is old, then you know that this argument that is being brought to view is a dangerous one because this movement has never created light. There is no such thing as the creation of new truth. If it were, when we go back to the Old Testament and we ask Solomon's thoughts on the subject, he will tell us that there is nothing new under the sun. Everything gets recycled. You cannot create new information. So I will speak more to this issue and be more pointed and more clear about that. The fact that Elder Jeff is raised up as the first angel, as a messenger, having new light and an increase of knowledge is just the repackaging and re-understanding of old truths. The technique and the methodology that he employs is no different to the methodology that Ellen White uses, that the Millerites used, and if I can just drop a name in of other prophets that Paul used, that Peter used, obviously that Christ used, that Moses used, and I would also say in giving the final uh, closing prophet that uses the same methodology, the same technique, Job. Every messenger will always use the same technique, the same methodology of line upon line. The problem is, depending on, upon their ability, their um, intellectual acumen, where they've gone, their educational background, they would explain things in different ways. If you were a shepherd boy, you might portray truths as poems because you learned to sing songs to your flock. If you were brought up in a seminary, you may choose to share the message in a much more theological, didactic fashion using um, precise techniques that you have uh, gleaned, you have learned and refined over years of straight, hard academic study. So whether you're David or whether you're Paul, You'll be teaching the same thing with the same methodology, but you will use a different language and it can be so different. The uninitiated will look at David and say much of that is not line upon line. Whereas much of what Paul would uh, be teaching is line upon line. And this is the problem that we're confronted with when it comes to this issue about how we deal with present truth. So, we know that God is going to raise up a messenger, messengers. They will begin to reinterpret, reevaluate, to re-message what 
inspiration teaches, particularly Ellen White. People will be challenged by this. Some who cannot see what is being taught will leave the movement because they are not persuaded by the cult of personality, the sheer force of personality that this messenger has in, in order to be persuasive of what is right and what is wrong. They need more. The people who remain are so enamoured, um, are so taken by this messenger that they will just accept what the messenger says and if they see problems they will see this as either stepping stones to greater truth or they will see it as some kind of fault in themselves because of their own weakness in understanding inspiration and they will be persuaded by the messenger that the messenger's perspective is the right one and there are others who just plainly don't know what they're doing and they just get swept along 13 years ago things began to change and this change has happened progressively to the place now where we really, in this movement, are very, um, are very focused, very fixated about methodology and not about the cult of personality. Each of us are painfully aware. It was only just over a year ago that this movement received its most intense and painful split, separation, when the person that God had raised up to lead this movement walked away and left, Elder Jeff Tippinger. And to be clear, the reason why that separation occurred was that people were forced to choose one of two things one of two one of two methodologies if you like either the methodology of actually trying to understand inspiration which we call today parable teaching which is approaching scripture with intellectual honesty or your other option was to trust in the word of the first angel to trust the messenger had been, that had been raised up and to trust them despite the fact that they didn't have the answers that they had themselves admitted that they had been confused in the past that they had made grave errors of judgment both theologically organizationally and interpersonally Despite all of that, people remained to stand by that first messenger's side because they just trusted that person. Not because they necessarily understood what he said, not because they necessarily even believed what he said, but just because, sorry, um, not, not that they could defend what he said, but just because they believed what he said. They believed that if he said it, it must be true, even though it made no sense whatsoever. I've already spent time in the past, in the public domain, explaining what happened after the separation in this movement. How having absolutely no direction, no message, if I can call it this, a threefold union was formed between that messenger, between another member in the movement, and I'll say two other members in the movement. One from Canada that we're all that we're all familiar with, and one from Europe, which probably uh, many of us are unaware of. Each one of these three people bring together some bring together 
um, something. They all have something to contribute to their new formed alliance. One of them is the study of Nashville. One of them is the study of time. And the other one is the cult of personality. And when those three come together, they become a toxic, potent mix that many people are beguiled about. We know much of that has now been diffused, that that union has essentially dissolved, and each of those um, elements are now basically in free fall. The study is not to deal with them. The only reason I mention that is because last year what every single one of us was confronted with was the reality of whether or not we will stand by truth, by our ability to read and understand inspiration or whether we would follow a human agent whom we still believe is a messenger of God being used by God to do a work and even though there was compelling evidence to show not I was going to say suggest but it's not suggest to actually show that that was not the case they had no message from God people were still willing to follow because Old habits die hard and the cult of personality is not only a powerful force it is also a subject of Bible prophecy and people cannot escape their own prophetic fate unfortunately we know that he didn't have any message to give because he had to import it from others <coughs> In fact, he just became essentially a facilitator. Someone who would just facilitate this um, newfangled message to be delivered and put into the public domain, which is, as I said, we all know, fell on its face. So, I want to summarise the points that I've um, tried to address today. Adventism has been confronted with a problem since its inception. How do we relate to Ellen White? You either love her or you hate her. And that's pretty much what people have been confronted with. This was both in her lifetime, in her death, but particularly since 1989, since the raising up of this movement, how we relate to Ellen White has been a fundamental testing point that has and continues to shake God's church, whether people realise it or not. Every single one of us is confronted with Alan White and who she is. The reason people struggle with her writings and I don't want to talk about the class of people who just want to live their own if I can call it sinful personal selfish lives. Those people who just want to do what they want and they don't find enough restraint in holy writ in the Bible to constrain them in a way that Ellen White will. She shackles people. So not talking about those gr that group of people, I'm talking about people who are willing to see what Ellen White has to say and what they are confronted with is her many idiosyncrasies, many inconsistencies. And those people end up rejecting Ellen White 
because they're forced to do so intellectually. Often they will still give lip service to believing in Ellen White, in believing in Ellen White, because Ellen White speaks much about morality and they can empathise and um, share her moral perspective on things. And so they, there is a semblance of, of accepting her, or I call it lip service. I'm not dealing with that group of people. It's, those, it's that group that do accept her. And what ends up happening is because we find ourselves, this group of people, in a difficult situation, they have to put blinkers over their eyes so that they can be willingly blind to some of the problem areas in Alan White's writings that just don't make sense and they can't understand them and they've been taught that you either accept Alan White in her entirety or you reject her. You can't pick and choose which bits you will like. They accept that logic and therefore they're forced to just close their minds to certain thoughts, certain ideas that she portrays. Then this movement is raised up God raises a, a messenger and he begins to look at Ellen White's writings in a way that is completely antagonistic to what she actually teaches. I gave an example, the latter rain. Ellen White clearly teaches that the latter rain comes after the National Sunday Law of Daniel 11 verse 41. That last verse is only pertinent obviously to priests, to this movement. It means nothing to a regular Adventist. But we teach in this movement that the latter rain actually occurs before the Sunday law. And when challenged on that, we would just say, accept or die. The logic or the choice is that simple. Either accept what Elder Jeff Pippen just says or just die because we all know this is a life and death message. And all those people that would question, we would just label them as troublers in Israel and they would eventually leave. And that's the story that I gave about this member who left over that issue, the lateral rain. And the problem is that what we actually find is that this movement has gone into, this in, into inspiration, into spirit of prophecy and has selectively read her writings, have selectively understood what she says, and many of us are unaware of this. Around 2007, the subject of the cult of personality that had existed in this movement for decades before, I guess one and a half decades, thereabouts, began to be challenged and as in any light, in any movement, this thing happened so subtly, so quietly, so gently, no one ever noticed. And what begins to happen is God raises up people who are going to be really serious about methodology. And in that critical view of what they read, they begin to challenge the status quo of this movement. And in order for them to be able to do that, they have to be placed in positions of responsibility, which ends up happening providentially. We jump forward from 2007, 2019. That's 12 years, I think. And we are going to separate or split this movement. And we do not split over theological issues about how we see things differently. That is not what this movement splits over. What we split over is much more simple, much more ugly. We split over whether or not we will follow a human being, and I don't mean to say we follow a man. I don't want to portray it that way. 
whether or not we will follow the messenger that the Lord has raised up or we will follow our nose we will follow our own thinking our own ideas our own methodology I call that parable teaching either we're going to go and be with the group that desire to study or we're going to be with the group that just want to follow the cult of personality now people have been in this movement for too long just having a messenger there is not enough they need a message and one was provided conveniently for them almost immediately I would say providentially and when that message was providentially given to them the messenger latched onto that used his personality his influence to drive that message forward and it just ended up crashing headlong into a brick wall and is basically destroyed and I think most of us already are aware of that know that So what each of us who are in this movement today are left with is the fact that we are here because we claim to believe in having methodology being more important to us than the messenger, than the person that God had raised up the cult of personality so I want to um, pause here this is a convenient place to pause um, I've already given a fairly robust summary if we can conceptualize or try to put a title to this introductory presentation besides calling it an introduction is an analysis on methodology I want us to see how God has brought us to the place where we are today where we are now focused on understanding things we're using the correct methodology as opposed to understanding things because of the cult of personality Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your goodness and mercy. Lord, each of us who has bowed down before you, wherever we find ourselves today, we know that there is trouble in our camp. There are problems. There are rumblings and intermittently there are short small bursts of violent behavior indicating Lord that another great shaking or eruption is about to befall your people we want to ask and pray Lord that you would guide and direct us in the consideration of your word May each of us understand why we are here today. Why we chose 12 months ago to remain in your movement rather than following a personality. Well, please guide, direct and bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.